Everyone, these are going to be the notes from the class I'm taking over recombinant approaches for yeast. So first, we have to review the characteristics of fungi. They're eukaryotes. They produce sexual and asexual spores. They could grow as hyphae, which are apical or as yeast. And they're going to be saprophytes or symbionts. So saprophytes are going to be feeding off decaying matter. So like dead plants, animals, other compounds are just broken down, decaying matter again. They're heterotrophic. They do not perform photosynthesis. And some of them are parasites. So that's why we have parasitism listed. Yeast is the model eukaryote. It carries out post-translational um, post modification. So that's supposed to be G-S-L-N, not transcription. Sorry about that. Post-translational modification of proteins. One example would be glycosylation, where we're going to be adding oligosaccharide units to a protein. This will allow for correct folding and defense against proteolytic enzymes. Human peptides um, are going to be able to be processed by the yeast, so we just need to glycosylate them. They could also last a long time, too, if we glycosylate them when we're using yeast. Okay, so protein secretion. So secretory proteins are synthesized by ribosomes in the endoplasmic reticulum, the ER. So they are transported across the membrane by a mechanism using this signal recognition particle, this SRP. And when it enters the ER lumen, they are immediately glycosylated. So we have this we have this signal peptide at the end that's going to be recognized. And so it's going to go to the receptor and then we're going to have to cleave that end off. And then as it exits into the um, ER lumen, they're going to be glycosylated. All right, so first we're going to have to introduce DNA to yeast. However, let's go back here because, so you transfer through membrane by signal recognition particle, so SRP, and then terminal end is removed and glycosylated in the cytoplasm. So that's, again, protein, segrega um, protein segregation and secretion. All right, so let's talk about introducing DNA into yeast. So transformation is the only practical method of doing this. So this is transformation. So first, we're going to remove the cell wall by enzyme digestion, creating a spheroblast. This is just a naked yeast cell, basically, a spheroblast. Then you're going to incubate with DNA in the presence of calcium and glycol. Calcium and polyethylene glycol, these are going to be agents that simulate the membrane fusion process. You could also use um, lithium ions, and then you could incubate the DNA with polyethylene glycol. You could also use electroporation, which we've covered in the previous set of notes for bacterial transformation. And then we also have the gene gun. We have four yeast plasmids. We have the first type here, the yeast integrated plasmid. So YIPs, so they're going to be bacterial plasmid vectors with an added marker that makes their genetic selection in yeast possible. So we're going to have the ampicillin resistance gene, so it could be selected. But this is not practical in yeast. This will only be practical for bacteria. Because the yeast does not have peptidoglycan, so therefore the ampicillin, it won't have an effect on the yeast. Instead, markers used in the complement um, for defective genes in the host. So we're going to be looking at these complement 
genes to see if they're defective or not. Commonly used strains are defective in the amino acid leucine, for example. So leucine 2, this gene, um, it's the gene involved in leucine synthesis on a minimal medium. So when we have the knowledge of most strains not being able to make leucine, we add this leucine 2 gene, which allows for it to um, create leucine on minimal medium. That's how we're going to be selecting them. The vector will have the yeast gene for the missing function, basically. More on the yeast integrative plasmid, they lack an origin of replication for the yeast. So it has to be maintained in yeast cells only when they become integrated into the yeast chromosome. So this needs to be in the yeast chromosome first. It needs homologous recombination to happen for it to be replicated. And this homologous recombination will happen at the yeast marker gene or one of the other yeast sequences in the vector. But once it's integrated, they are inherited as the genome, as part of the genome now. And this is very rare for successful inheritance. The yeast replicating plasmid is type number two of these vectors. This is going to be selection markers useful in yeast. We again have the leucine 2 gene and the ampicillin in selecting the bacteria again. This one actually does have a yeast origin of replication, also known as an ARS, or an autonomously replicating sequence. Unlike the um, integrative plasmid, the yeast replicating plasmid does have the origin of replication for the yeast. And therefore, the plasmids can replicate without having to be integrated into the chromosome. Yet, only a small amount of this vector will be present whenever the um, yeast decides to budge. So there's a problem there a bit. So they're lost rapidly unless there's constant selection pressure. So you need to kind of force them, kind of need to force them to keep plasmid via pressure. And therefore, it's not very useful for the reproducible expression of cloned genes. The next type of plasmid used in yeast is the yeast episomal plasmid. This is going to be found in Cerevisiae, and some of these strains of, of this yeast contain the autonomously replicating high copy number plasmid called the 2UM plasmid. The origin of this plasmid is added to the yeast integrated ones to produce YEPs or yeast episomal plasmids that can exist in high copy numbers. The high copy numbers are like 30 to 50 copies per cell. So we're taking this origin from the YEP and putting it into the YIP. So YEP's origin goes into YIP. An episome is involved. This is an element that can exist as a plasmid or integrated into the chromosome. Like the YRPs, or the yeast replicating plasmid, they are poorly segregated into daughter cells. So this means that when they divide, there's poor, these have poor distribution. However, we kind of could work around that because there is a high copy number. If the entire 2 micrometer DNA, or 6.3 KB, is inserted into a YIP and introduced into yeast cells that lack that um, 2 micrometer plasmid, the copy numbers in excess of 200, 100, 200 per cell can be activated. So there's a high level of expression involved in the yeast episomal plasmid. 
We also have yeast centromeric plasmids. So centromeric sounds like the centromere that's used in mitosis. So YCPs are YRPs or YEPs with a sequence of yeast centromere inserted. So these are kind of like the YEPs as well as the YRPs, but they just have extra um, centromere gene in them. Spelt that incorrectly, sorry about that. So the centromeric sequence allows these plasmids to behave like chromosomes during mitotic division. Therefore, the YCPs are distributed to the daughter cells. Again, chromosome-like behavior with these plasmids, the centromeric plasmids. They're highly stable without maintenance by selection. And because they do behave like chromosomes, you're going to get a copy number of one to three. So not many copies, just one to three of the gene slash the protein when it's going through the whole dogma. A disadvantage when the plasmids are used for expression of clones genes. However, you could increase the amount of expression by using inducible promoters. So while it can't be used for cloned genes, you can use inducible promos to slightly increase that expression, even though that's kind of a disadvantage where you can't use these for cloned genes, the yeast centromeric plasmid. Our fourth type would be the yeast artificial chromosome, the YAC. This is a linear plasmid containing our origin of replication, which is our ARS, A-R-S, a centromeric sequence. And most important, there's also a telomere, a telomere here, on the yeast artificial chromosome. These allow them again to behave just like an actual chromosome. There's no limit to the amount of foreign DNA that can be cloned because it's linear. So no limit here because of that linear structure of the yeast artificial chromosome. YACs are not the first choice, though, when the main objective is a high level of expression of foreign genes. So it's not used for high expression of foreign genes because you need those promoters. All right, let's talk about ways of enhancing expression. So, plasmid copy number will be our first point. So, plasmid copy number, remember when we were talking about the yeast episomal plasmids and we were talking about how many of those are present in our yeast cells. We have high copy numbers of this 2 micrometer plasmid, so therefore we could use that to our advantage to... Um, have this high copy number plasmid as the best choice of maximal expression of any cloned gene. Let's go back to it. We're talking about that. High plasmid copy, yes. So the expression of foreign proteins is often toxic, however, for the yeast cells. So this high amount is kind of like a double-edged sword. This could cause the foreign proteins to misfold Within, with a higher chance in the cytoplasm. You could also have the chaperone molecules being sequestered. And when you stop the um, chaperones, this might affect the yeast and its own proteins. So there's a problem with this high plasmid number where again, you might overload the system, the foreign proteins might be toxic, they're going to misfold, and then also those chaperones are going to be busy and not attending to the yeast's own proteins in which it needs to survive. So low YEP and YIPs could increase stability. You need to add some YIPs. Remember, those are the yeast integrated plasmids. And you're going to have this leucine 2 gene because the yeast can't make um, leucine on their own. However, you could tell that they've been transformed if they're able to grow in that minimal median. All right, let's talk about adding a promoter sequence. So it must use a yeast promoter. They're different. The coding sequence of a foreign gene is usually inserted behind the yeast promoter. The promoters, again, are different from bacteria. Both are AT rich. However, the yeast usually use T-A-T-A, -A, so Tata, and then A-A. -A. 
versus in bacteria where we just have T A T A A T. So it's Tata, Tata box. Remember Tata box versus Tata or a longer double A right there in the middle. I don't know how to say it, but there we go. So we have the Tata sequence in yeast located much further upstream from the mRNA initiated site than it is in E. coli. That's also a good point to make there. If the expression of the foreign protein inhibits the growth of the yeast cells, you're going to be using regulator promoters. These initiate expression of foreign genes when the culture has reached a high density. So we're going to also add that. We could also look at um, the stability of mRNA, but that part isn't marked with the icon. So we're just going to glance over that. Okay, next will be the recognition of the AUG codon. This is the initiation codon. The correct AUG codon must be recognized by the initiation factors and the ribosome. The bacteria has this different system where they're pairing with this shine delgarno delgarno sequence with the complementary sequences in 16s rrna so yeast can't use this the bacteria have this shine delgarno sequence because there isn't an equivalent recognition sequence in the yeast so they must use aug with some axx in front of it so axx aug so this is the only alternative because in yeast, we do not have this Scheindel-Garno method or this Scheindel-Garno sequence. The Scheindel-Garno sequence is a ribosomal binding site, and it's used for bacterial and archaeal messenger RNA, and it's generally located around eight, be eight bases upstream from the start code in AUG. So in yeast, we don't have an alternative to that. All right, the last part, or second to last part, would be um, folding of foreign protein. This is another factor that could be used to enhance the um, usage of yeast. All right, so you're going to be producing proteins at high levels. They also need to fold properly. Again, structure and function are very tied together. So we're going to be using these chaperones. Again, we don't want to... We don't want to overwhelm the chaperones like we were talking about here. If we're using a YEP, which is going to have a high plasmid copy, that's a lot of foreign protein. These, again, are going to make the chaperones overworked. They won't be attending to the proteins that are necessary for the yeast themselves. So that's another tie in there. All right, enhancing expression with proteolysis. So many proteins in eukaryotic cells are subject to degradation by the ubiquitin pathway. So we're going to have to worry about that N-terminus. These proteins have certain amino acids at their N-terminus that are recognized by the ubiquitin, and that tags them for degradation via proteolytic degradation. So how do we solve this? So we're going to be changing that N-terminal. We could also fuse it as well. So we're going to fuse the protein to another one that is not known to be degraded by ubiquitin. Those are two ways of going around that. All right, and those are all going to be the slides of that little like marker thing. So please do something nice for someone and have a good one.